the uh, can we get the Askren one out of the way? And what, what do you think of the news? And does that change anything? Doesn't change anything. Would you guys still pursue him? Go on. No. No interest. No interest. We'll see him in World Series of Fighting or something. Exactly. Like I'm sure they'll pick him up. Is there a reason why you have no interest? Sure. Sure. I mean, you, have, have you they don't want him. Well, it's their champion. They don't want him. What, what does that say? I mean, what does that mean? I don't, I don't even care. Next question. I, I don't. I don't even care about those guys whatsoever. The guy, you know, listen. The, I feel sorry for the kids that fight there. I do. I truly feel sorry for the kids that have to be stuck in that shithole. And the fact that you would just give away a guy who has gone undefeated for you, it just shows what kind of people you are, what kind of business you do. Um, you know, and as far as the kid, as far as the level he's on, you know. He barely beat Jay Haran, you know. Um, he's got he's got some work to do. He can fight in, in, a, in, a, in another organization and work his way up. Is that a comment someday. on the way Bellator structures their their contracts with the fighters? They're bad guys. Does anybody here not think that they're bad guys in the way that they handle their people and the way they treat their talent? Does anybody not think they are? They are. I I, I don't even want to. They, they make me sick. I don't even want to even talk about them. Dana, when George lost the title to Matt Serra, people questioned his, uh, his mental toughness. What do you think uh, has turned around now? It's one of his strengths. His yeah. Um, you know, part of becoming a champion and, and retaining the title and, and doing what he's done and achieving what he's achieved is mental, mental and emotional toughness, toughness. I mean, there's tons of guys that are talented. It's, it's this thing, it's the drive. I mean, this guy, you see how he, he was saying how he obsessed about defending the title. That's how you have to be. And I say this all the time, but when you're as rich as George St. Pierre is, to stay that mentally tough and to keep having the drive and, and, and the passion to win that he does, that's what separates him from all is the he, rest. Is he rich or not? He, he's rich. He's very rich. But have you seen a change in him, though, over the years, progressively, as he defends more and more times? Have you, have you sensed, a, um, a, like, more of a fury in him? Like, wow, look how great I'm doing. I'm doing this for so long. Or have you seen it wane at all and think that he is near the end, even though he does it all the same? He's, he's always the same guy. He's, uh, you know, like I said, the guy, it's the thing that, 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 that makes this whole thing work. This whole machine is hunger and drive. You heard Woodley saying tonight, I want that shot at that title. Hey, Rory, get out of the way. I want that belt. You know, that's what keeps you, you know, and when you have as much money as George, I, I keep focusing on the money when I'm always a guy that says I don't like to talk about money, but here is where money is very relevant. When you have as much money as George St. Pierre has, and you're 31 years old, and you've been in the game, and achieved all the things that he's achieved, to still have that, that that drive and that desire to win is what sets him apart from all the rest. What do you think he said about uh, Rory that he doesn't want to fight? I think, I think the Rory thing, you know, obviously you guys, your job is to push him and, and, and say, all right, what are you going to do? Are you going to fight? He will fight George St. Pierre. I know it. You know it. Does he? Everybody knows it. What makes you say that? He, can, come on. You can't read this kid that he wants to fight George St. Pierre. He's in a, he's in a, he's living in George St. Pierre's house. What you don't do is you, you don't say you want to fight the guy. You know, it's like saying I want to punch the guy in the face whose house I'm living in. You know, <laughs> there you go. Well said. What does George have to do, in your opinion, to surpass Anderson as the greatest MMA fighter of all time? The thing that sets Anderson apart from George is that that one loss. You know, he came in. And, and, and dominated for as many years as he did, you know, and he just lost, you know, and the guy's 38 years old. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's tough. It's tough to overcome the Anderson thing because, uh, you know, what if George sticks around for another six, seven years? That'd be pretty damn impressive. To, I mean, to, to go, you guys all know in this sport, to go undefeated for a long period of time is the big deal, especially if you're the champion. All the best in the world are gunning at you all the time. The super fight idea, though, you know, we talk about that with George, and is it a type of thing where he would just continue to defend, or would you like to set him up in some of these quote-unquote super fights? I think with, the little know. super fight thing has been destroyed. I think it's dead now. It was fun for a little while. I think it's over. Dana, how long ago you talking about 
about with George St. Pierre. Is there anyone else, do you think, in your time who's been able to sustain that like he has? As you say, he's a multimillionaire. Anderson's got a lot of money, too. Yeah. You know? Anderson's got a lot of money. I'd have to say if you had to, if you had to compare bank accounts, they're neck and neck. You know? Um, and I'm, George St. Pierre squeaks him out a bit because George is the biggest pay-per-view star. And you know with George as well that he is eking out every bit of ability he's got as well, isn't he, in a different way? You see a guy, and it was said in the press conference, you see a guy doing interviews with a busted split nose right here, huge black eye. Well, eye so black that it actually looks like he has black eyeliner across his eye. You know, that's a guy who's busting his ass in the gym every day. That's the guy who's... who's uh, doing everything it takes to win another title defense. Is that why he's, when, does he surprise you with his comments like, you know, I've been thinking of uh, Johnny Hendricks from the day I beat Nick Diaz, and, and he says, sorry, I didn't mean to do it badly, but um, he, and he says, I've prepared to be hit in the face by him. I'm mentally ready to be hit in the face by Johnny Hendricks. He, he's an absolute professional. He's an absolute professional. No matter how dominant he has been over the last however many years, he, does, he still takes guys seriously. He still puts in the hard work. He, he, he's a dedicated professional is what that guy is. And, I, and like I said, to deal with George St. Pierre over the last, when Karen just asked me, I said it's like this. There's no ego with George St. Pierre. There's no, uh, you know, the worst thing that happens to these guys are the Klingons. The people who cling on to them and like, oh man, you're the greatest, you're getting fucked, you should be making this and you should be doing that and you should be doing this. All these guys that are, that are all of a sudden geniuses telling him what he should be doing and should be getting. George St. Pierre has never allowed himself to, to let Klingons get, get onto him, you know? There's no barnacles on that kid's back. That kid is his own man. He does his own thing. And let me tell you what, you, you don't think there's ever been a time when I've said, George, I need you to do this. And, and George, you know, isn't, doesn't want to do that. Of course we've had those, but you've never heard about it. You know why? Because George St. Pierre is a man and he's a professional and he picks up the phone and he calls himself and he says, can we work this out? Um, I know you want me to go here, 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 and here. Can I go here and here for you and not do, you know, he's a professional. He's, he's literally, out of all the fighters we've ever had, including Chuck Liddell, who is one of, considered part of my family, okay, nobody has been easier and more professional to work with than George St. Pierre. He is the epitome of a He is the epitome fighter. of a champion and the guy, if you could, if I could say, how would I want every guy to be with the deal like I'd want it to be George St. Pierre? You brought up the Chuck Liddell era. You've been here for 10 years, a little bit more. Um, since your era, we're on the 20th anniversary. When you look back, what is kind of your favorite time? Was it the Lesnar era? Was it the Liddell era? Was they, it the launch? They of were tough? all great in their own way. You know, everything that we've done and all the guys who've come at the time that they've come have, have, have affected and helped grow the sport in their own little way. I mean, even the Brock Lesnar thing, like people will still try to ask me questions knocking Brock Lesnar. It was, the Brock Lesnar era was awesome. It was so much fun. Um, you know, Some of the best and, crowds will probably ever have. Yeah, and and the uh, the uh, you know even the way Brock acted sometimes at the time it wasn't fun for me, but as I look back on it, I, I had a blast with Brock Lesnar. When was the last time you talked to him? I talked. Well, we exchanged texts about uh, two and a half weeks ago. You know, uh, talking about the twentieth anniversary and you know that he he was a part of the documentary and you know. He's not here, is he? No. no. He's talked about moving to Canada. Did he? Yeah. He likes this guy. He loves the medical. Loves the, uh, <laughs> care up there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. Continuing yeah. with the... ...the fans, uh, do you imagine, uh, if, uh, the UFC Montreal reached out, uh, George and Jan. For the fans of Montreal to what? Uh, to get a show, uh, reach out, uh, George and Jan. Yeah, we, we actually headlined two Brazilians in Montreal. Uh, it was uh, Shogun versus Machida. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. yeah. What is it? And, 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 and Jones Anderson and Dallas yeah. Latest. So, yeah, we, we've done Montreal with, without George St. Pierre. You know, obviously, Canada with George St. Pierre is, is great, but Canada is, there's so many hardcore fans in Canada. I, I could headline a card up there with anybody and it's going to do well. Hey, Danny, yeah. the read the 20th anniversary. Yeah. On the day that you gave the Do You Want to Be a Fucking Fighter speech, yep. could you ever have envisioned what was to come 10 years later from that? You know, that, When that season was happening, I felt like we were fighting for our life. 
you know? There was a point in time during the filming of The Ultimate Fighter that we didn't even know if it would air. That it might not even air. Yeah, Spike said they would air it, but Spike TV was a mess. A mess. There were times when we didn't even think this was going to air. Did they Watch cut anything that you had done that you wanted to put on? They say that we can't put that on our air? No. They were very easy to work with. They were completely absent during the season, the whole filming of the, of the season of The Ultimate Fighter. Halfway through the season, Albie Hecht, who was the president of the network, got fired. So they literally went radio silent on us. We're sitting out there filming, and, you know, the president leaves who agreed to this deal with us. Who knows if the new president coming on board will agree to it? Who's the new guy going to be? Who, what's he going to think of MMA? Maybe he's going to go in a completely different direction. Maybe he doesn't want this free programming. It was, I can't tell you how crazy that first season of The Ultimate Fighter. I'm filming this thing. I literally lived at that gym. That, that television office became my office. I lived at that gym the eight weeks that we filmed there, and I was literally flying back and forth between Las Vegas and New York nonstop because it was hard to even get them on the phone. When he got fired, people were basically hiding in their cubicles, hoping they weren't next. Watching the documentary, we have the sense that I, I do have the sense that you save the sport of MMA by purchasing the company and not giving up on it. Do you feel you saved this sport and are you proud of it? Um, you know, I don't, I don't look at it that way. I, I, that would be arrogant, you know, it really would, but I'll, I'll be a little arrogant <laughs> here. I, I'll tell you this, I don't think anybody could have done it but me and the Fertitas the way that we did it and, and the way that we wanted to do it. I don't think anybody else could have done it. You know, but when you take something like this and you own it and you do it, I guess that's the way you're supposed to feel. Do you, you know think it's I mean? your personality too, though? Because some people compare you to leaders of other sports and they say, well, Dana White is not as refined and Dana this and Dana that and the other guys don't say F. But I'm curious, I mean, do you, do you believe that it would have been as successful had you been a, po uh, forgive mm. me, but a polite, you know, a polite businessman? Are you saying I, please I and thank you? I don't know. Uh, this isn't a polite business. Yeah. You know, I'm in the fight business. Um, I, I believe that in building this brand, there were many ingredients in the pot that helped. You know, I think it was a combination of everything and timing and, and I mean, just everything that happened couldn't have been more perfect, couldn't have been the better time. Um, I mean, think about this. Let's say we bought it in 2001, right? Let's say we come up with the reality show idea in 2003 that switch from the Nashville network to spike wasn't happening who I just everything as it happened at the time that it happened the cast that we put together I mean when you watch that documentary the cast that they wanted was not the cast that I wanted so we had to compromise there was some you know we had to okay this that um, you know, my whole keeping up with the Kardashians thing and the thing, you know, we, we, we had to have, and, and the cast that we cast ended up being perfect. Couldn't be a better cast. And, and even a guy like, like Bobby Southworth, you know, it, it took his personality and, and his, you know, the beef that he, he, he ignited the whole thing between Koscheck and, 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 and Lieben. And the fact that him and Koscheck became buddies and the fight that I got into with Bobby Southworth, two or three fights that I got into with Bobby Southworth that season. Um, it was all the perfect mix at the right time for everything to happen. Why did you call him? Because I've been thinking about him, you know? Just I, like that? Yeah. I, I, I was thinking about him, and, uh, and I called him to let him know he's just as much a part of what happened here as Stefan and Forrest and, and everybody else, even though he's still not here. Well, Danny, you, you're, 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 reaction, like, you know, you're he said call thanks, him. man. He couldn't have been. He said, what an amazing ride I wouldn't change one thing if I could go back in time knowing what I know now I would still try out for that show and I would be on it and it was it was a hell of a ride and, and, I, and I love sitting back and seeing what it's what's going on with it now. Have playing the entire cast in the Hall of Fame. yes I would I would consider that Danny, you're good. I have a huge huge like when Koscheck was talking today about you know you never know when this is going to be your last fight. I have this huge soft spot for the entire cast of the season of the Ultimate Fighter. Have you thought about it? 
not till just this minute. He'll take the, credit for that too, I'm everybody. Anthony Dana. Pettis has been injured again this time, obviously out. How much of injuries kind of prevented him from becoming <coughs> one of the biggest stars? stars. Because you know, yeah. the Aldo fight, he missed, I think, almost all of 2012 after the Lozon fight. I mean, how much are injuries defining his career? Unfortunately, it's, yeah, it's, it is very unfortunate. I, I'm not kidding you when I say this. I think the two most talented guys right now, the two guys that I think are the are the hottest prospects to become huge superstars, are Hennon Barrow and uh, and Pettis. And uh, obviously, the the Pettis thing is is, is, is unfortunate. When is, the, when is the decision going to be made for? Because obviously, I think Ariel reported. Obviously, we're not sure if he's going to be out for four weeks or six months. He's going to have that, surgery. So how long are, are we talking? Seven eight months. So is that, are you going to move forward with the division? Josh is going to fight. TJ Grant's going to fight. Yeah, these guys will keep fighting. Yeah. Ben, have well, you heard any reports of the Canada Ultimate Fighter? How that's going? Uh, it's great. The one thing that that's coming out of that is the fights are awesome. So I always, when fights are awesome, I'm happy. And the reality is what it is. Is there an update on McGregor? McGregor's timeline. healing timeline. well, and yeah, he'll be here this weekend. You guys will see him. Okay. His mouth yes. works fine. He's here, yeah, his mouth's working, his <laughs> yeah. knee, and his knee is catching up. <laughs> as far as Pettis goes, are you thinking actually of doing an interim belt while he has surgery? Nope. When you talk about the, just now about how it was the perfect timing to do the Tough Series, obviously it was the perfect timing to meet Lorenzo at the wedding when you were reunited, wasn't it? Um, well, I'm getting weird on all you guys. <laughs> when I sit back and I yeah. look at all the things that happened, to get to this, sitting in this chair right here now, it just freaks me out. Because that's how you first, obviously everybody knows the story, but to what extent, what I want to ask was. So, first of all, the wedding thing. Yeah. I didn't want to, I was, I was going to go to the wedding by myself. <laughs> My wife was doing something else that night, and uh, she couldn't go to the wedding. So, actually I don't even, you know, we weren't, we, I wasn't even married then, now that I think about it. But I was, go, I was going to go to this thing alone, right? I'm, not, I'm like, I'm not going to go to a fucking wedding by myself. I'm going to go sit at a table with a bunch of people. You know how that is, right? I'm sitting at the table with a bunch of people I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm like, this is, I'm not, I'm not going to go. And then I'm like, this guy used to drive me to school every day. How am I not going to go to his wedding? So I go to his wedding, and Lorenzo's there. And he's at, we're, we're both up getting food when it's time to go get food. We started talking, and we've been together ever since, you know? So I'm not saying that if I didn't go to that wedding, I wouldn't have bumped into Lorenzo. But if I didn't go to that wedding, I probably would not have bumped into Lorenzo, and it probably wouldn't happen. Fast forwarding, to what extent do you talk about the inspiration of doing the right things at the right time or the serendipity, the luck of it? To what extent is it now, though, what percentage is inspiration and what percentage is perspiration? Though? Because they say it's, the great things are often 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration. What's it like at the UFC? Well... Obviously, there's, there were things that, that lined up for us to, you know, I, I just told this to somebody the other day, too. I was offered a huge job, huge, not a job, but a, a huge position with, with equity and a car, a house, like a huge, huge deal before we bought the UFC. So Lorenzo and I were doing a ton of shit together and, and Frank and, and, uh, I was like, man, I wonder if I should do this. So I said to Lorenzo, I said, listen, I just got this, uh, this offer to do this thing. And Lorenzo looked at me like, what the fuck are you talking about? I thought we were going to do something together. I was like, done, <laughs> done. And literally three weeks later, the UFC thing happened. Three weeks after that thing happened. So there's just so many things. And there's nights that Lorenzo and I will sit around drinking and just go, holy shit, and talk about all these little things that, that happened and what went on, and, and uh, it's crazy. Dana, do you want to see those things stacking up? Does it force you to work even harder because you realize nah. you get the opportunity? No, nah, I mean, that's how we are. That's the way that we're built, and that's what we do. It's like I, I'm so in on this thing, it's scary. Even after all these years and all the things, and the stuff that we're working on is not only – what's cool about – you know, as we all sit here and, and do these, these scrums and we travel around the world together and fucking sit here and do this shit every week, you know, I, when, I, when we sit in these rooms and we, we start to put these things together that we're building and working on, I get excited for everybody because it doesn't just affect me. It doesn't just affect the people who work for my company. It affects you. It affects the fighters. It affects everybody who's involved in this sport. 
And the shit that we're working on in the next five years, and I know you guys have heard me say this a million times, but every time I say it, we fucking do it. And right. I'm telling you all right here, right now, the stuff that we're doing over the next five years just continues to take this thing to new levels and unbelievable heights that everybody, you know, I love, especially now, you know, with, with, with things that are going on and every time a new competitor pops up or the, somebody that people call a competitor or, you know, oh, look at their TV ratings and, and look at what they're doing here and look what they're doing now. Are you seriously going to start fucking betting against us now? Now, after all the things we've done and where we are and what we, 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 we now you're going to bet against us or is it just the fun thing to talk about today, you know? We're not going anywhere, and we're just going here, and it continues to get bigger and bigger and crazier and crazier. On this you're card, quick, you're quick to point out that the sport, uh, the UFC, is not mainstream yet. Obviously, it has a lot of room to grow, but as, as huge as it's gotten in uh, 20 years, particularly since you and the Fertitas have have owned it, part of the appeal, I think, is is the grassroots uh, approach, the connectivity with the fans and the fighters. Is there anything in the back of your mind that makes you think, I want to make sure this thing doesn't get too big and lose touch There's with no fans? Thing. I mean, if I lost touch, we're doing the same scrums we've been doing since, you know, you don't see me going out, that's the end of our press conference, boys, I got to leave now, I'm moving on. You know what I mean? We're, we're still here doing the scrums. I still get on the internet. I still go toe-to-toe -to -toe with people on Twitter. I still go out and talk to fans. The fighters still talk to fans. The difference is, the bigger we get, the more people we talk to, the more people we hang out with, the more incredible, not to mention the fact that you know, this whole bullshit idea that there's too many fights. We haven't had a bad fight. The, the, as far as I can remember is, is Henderson and Pettis because I start to lose track after that because we're doing so much shit. And, and I know it even goes before that. When's the last fight that everybody was like, eh, all right, that, this one wasn't so great. I wish I stayed in Vegas and covered this one on TV. When was that last fight? Somebody tell me when fight that last card fight. Or fight. Winnipeg, fight card. Winnipeg, Winnipeg, yeah, Winnipeg. Winnipeg got some backlash. Or well, yeah. Calgary last year. Calgary. <laughs> I'm saying this year. Okay. This year. Last year we could crack off, you know, a shitload of them. It's, it's interesting you. Winnipeg? What was Winnipeg? That's it. It's interesting you, that you bring that up about when people say there are too many fights because for somebody like me, I don't like a sport where somebody doesn't hit someone. So do you think that people like me get overlooked or people who cover sports the way that I do get overlooked in terms of a lot of people are looking at football, basketball, hockey, but there are sports fans who are only interested in combat sports. Right. So those are what you call the hardcores, okay? You have the hardcores that are only interested. I'm a hardcore. I, I, I'll watch the Patriots game on Sunday. I'll cruise around with a little bit of football. Other than that, no other sport has my attention, okay? Um, I care about boxing. I care about MMA. And I care about any good fight that could be perceived that there's a good fight going to happen. I'll go to a small show. I'll, I'll go to any fights. Then you have people who, like this weekend, there's 20th anniversary. There's some buzz. There's some people who hang out on the fringe and have some friends that are into it, so they'll get into it. And then if you have an even bigger fight, which will be Anderson Silva, I think. You know, this is just my opinion. I'm sure you all have your own. That fight will pull in people that don't even watch. You know, people who maybe watch one a year, if that, because there's just just big spillover on that. This is a big event, and I have to watch it. People that go to church on Christmas and only. <laughs> <laughs> right. How about the uh, Russian influx of fighters lately? We have guys like Habilov, uh, Ali Bagatinov, and uh, Khabib Nurmagomedov coming in. And These guys are exciting. Um, you know, this this is booming in Russia too. We're, I told you guys we're working on Russia. It's not just a coincidence that there are Russian mm -hmm. fighters now coming into the UFC. Um, everything is, is, is going according to plan. Is it getting any closer to being a date or time for when you actually have a, a card in Russia? Make it in the summer, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we are getting closer. We're, we're getting closer and we're laying the groundwork and Everything is going very well. Dan, are you getting famously how Chael Sonnen transcends with TV and everything else he does? I asked him this question yesterday, so I'll ask you. When he's done, do you see Chael maybe doing an administrative role at the UFC with all the travel and everything, kind of playing you overseas or something like Could you see him getting involved with the UFC on that level? I could. Um, I could. I, the thing that I like about Chael um, is, is he's, a, he's a motivator. He's a smart guy. He knows how to how to talk to, to fighters. He knows how to talk to the public. Um, 
For instance, I'll give you an example, Kong Li. Kong Li was the me of China. And thank God we sent him over there. He did a phenomenal job for us in China. Um, and, and it's kind of one of the things that I'm talking about when I'm saying there's no other sport out there, combat, no other combat sport, where as the sport continues to grow, the athletes have so many opportunities. Look at right now how many, how many sportscasters there are. I mean, Brian uh, is now doing college football. You know what I mean? Uh, all these other guys that Fox has hired, well, now ESPN is starting to hire UFC fighters now to cover the sport. Um, and now all the other countries that we're going to, Michael Bisping is doing a deal with BT. You know, uh, they're talking to Dan Hardy out in England now about becoming a, a, a sportscaster. Um, for Doom, for Doom, for Doom yeah. Junior Dos Santos, I just bumped into him. He, he was doing television down, and the opportunities for the fighters are, are huge, huge, massive opportunities to be on television. What, what other combat sport does that? Roy Jones is on HBO. You don't see, I mean, I don't see that many, that many other fighters Andre getting Ward. that Holy type Holland, of opportunity. Yeah. But how many? If you look at how big boxing is, how many are really getting that opportunity? And this thing, I always look at the UFC. Um, you know, when people, you know, people start throwing around the Floyd Mayweather money and all the other things. Yeah, thing didn't start making money till 2007. It's 2013, and look at all the opportunity that's out there right now. Speaking of that, just a quick question. In September, you had, you know, you came after Mayweather on your pay-per-view. Now this week, you're going before Pacquiao. Um, obviously, both of those guys are big pay-per-view draws. Do you prefer being ahead of the big boxing pay-per-view or behind? It doesn't matter. I mean, you, you have to. You're going to land wherever you're going to land. We're doing so many fights. It's not like we're, we're just doing. It's not like boxing where we're doing a couple of big fights a year. We're doing tons of fights. So when we plan out our schedule, we know where they're going to be, and we, we land wherever we land. Because here's the thing. The other thing is, when I put on, let's say, let's say I'm going before whether it's before Mayweather or Pacquiao or whatever, then they're going to fight. Then I got another fight coming right after that. It's not like I'm just out in the middle of, you know, it's that fight alone and I'm, I don't have anything else going on for months. With Filipinos being such a big fan base of yours, you know, I know that they're a growing fan base and obviously they have Pacquiao fighting next week. Do you budget a little less because of that? Because knowing, okay, we would get the Filipinos this week, but now Pacquiao's fighting so we won't get them. I don't think that that's true. I think that... When you're talking about the hardcores, when you talk about Filipino fight fans, you're going to have hardcore. When you're hardcore, you're going to watch both. You're not just going to watch one. It's like me saying, you know, like me saying I'm not going to watch the Pacquiao fight. Damn right I'm going to watch the Pacquiao fight. And if we have a fight that night, there's, there's nights where we have fights in, in my room in the back because I always stay in the room and I watch all the prelims and then I come out before we, the main, main card goes on. And there will be nights when I have <laughs> – two or three TVs set up in the back and I have one fight here whether it's boxing on Showtime I have boxing on HBO or a pay-per-view I'll have the pay-per-view in the back or and I have our fights that I'm watching so I'm watching all three in a <clears throat> Brazil Chael and Mandalay here in the US what will it? Brazil we're still working on that whole thing I, I don't know how all that's gonna work out I'm all, I'm we were down in Brazil we flew from you know the fight that night to Rio Spent the weekend there because we had a big meeting with Globo. We're still trying to hammer out all the details of that. One of the things that Globo doesn't like to do is they don't like translation. They like when you're on their TV. And it would be like us doing the Ultimate Fighter here on Big Fox and one of the guys not speaking English and you have to subtitle him. It's tough to do. We're trying to work through everything. We're trying to figure everything out. And then we'll figure out what we're going to do with the rest of the world. Will Chael uh, coach Brazilians? Yes. A month, a month ago, you said it, it was a crazy idea to put Chael at six or seven weeks in Brazil because of the security thing. What changed your mind? Well, I knew what I was going to do then. I just didn't want to tell you. <laughs> Chael gave us uh, how his fight, how he learned of the fight with Evans coming up, and he had said he would be okay at 205 pounds and anybody but uh, Rashad. Why did you make that fight then? Was it just the, the fight you thought needed to be made? Yeah, that was the fight that we were playing. You know, he just beat... Shogun, um, and you know Rashad's top of the heap. And, you know it, it, it's one of those things. If you want to continue to get back up <coughs> toward the belt, <clears throat> gotta fight these guys. After a win, beating Shogun. You know, no disrespect to Vanderlei, 
<clears throat> but Vanderlei is a grudge match. This is a fight that, that needs to happen. Rory keeps on talking about, and he has again this <clears throat> week, saying that you know he'll avoid George, and I know you you say they're going to fight, but uh, do you see? Uh, you know, he's also you said that he's living in George's house. If that continues, what is he going to do? Is he going to? I'm going to tell you what I think happens, and I know nothing. Okay, I know nothing. These guys don't tell me anything. I don't give a shit. When we get to a certain point, when the time comes that we have to make something, we make it and we do it. This is my prediction. Nostradana. This is what I, think. <laughs> I think if he beats Robbie Lawler, I think he's going to move out of George's house. And I think things are going to change. I think this is the fight right here for him <clears throat> that's going to put him in the direction of fighting George St. Pierre. And uh, I think that that he wins this fight. He's moving out. Going to get his own place. <laughs> that happened. Would you think it would be as messy as, as Jones and, and Rashad was? I don't think it will because I honestly believe I know George St. Pierre. I know what a professional he is. And I know... I mean, when has George St. Pierre ever not fought somebody who deserved to be next? When has George St. Pierre ever done that? You know, George St. Pierre's never been one of those champions where he's like, I don't think this guy should be fighting me. This guy doesn't deserve to be here. This guy, he's like, who's next? You think this is the guy that's next and this is the guy I'll beat? That's the way George St. Pierre has handled his career. And, and when that time comes for Rory, you know he's going to give him that opportunity. And you fucking know Rory wants it. You know he wants it. When you say his house, they actually live together? You just slap him from behind. You're the closest. I figure you're the one with the best. He's training in his... No, but you said you'll actually move. So you're, you're saying house is TriStar. Yes. <laughs> what about... <laughs> yeah, they're roommates. George St. Pierre's a multi, multi-fucking millionaire, and they're roommates. They have bunk beds. Yeah, they have bunk beds. Dana, <laughs> Dana it, it was a okay, let me ask you one more question. Okay. Uh, when was the last time someone... Approached you guys. He just does shit like that so he can get the next question. When was the last time someone approached you guys about selling the UFC? Um, 2000 and, uh, 2008? Why? Why are you asking? Well, because when you were talking about, you know, just the beginning, I was, I was thinking, and then you were in Abu Dhabi talking to your partners, mm -hmm. and I'll be thinking about it. Has anyone approached you with the, the rise of the UFC? You used to say that you used to get offers all the we time. Did. We did. We used to get offers all the time, and 2008 was probably our biggest and most legitimate offer that we've ever had from a legitimate company that would have paid legitimate money and, and, and could have done it. Um, and I just think that we're at a level now where there's probably... I don't know, one or two or three or four people in the world that could actually purchase this company. And uh, when you go to Abu Dhabi and talk to uh, the Sheik and your partners, <clears throat> do they have any, like, do you have to uh, talk to them when you make a deal with Globo or Fox? Like, are they, or are they just kind of uh, silent partners? So, yeah, they're, they're, you know, we don't treat anybody, especially people that we respect as much as them, like silent partners. You know, obviously they invested in this company, they bought a minority stake and they trust us to, to, to run it. We, uh, we keep them in the loop on everything that we do. You know, it's no different. Obviously, Frank Fertitta is one of the majority owners of this thing, but Frank doesn't know every little thing that's going on. But when we make big moves and we, we start looking at big decisions, we get Frank and we get Frank involved. Um, when we, you know, our daily business, we probably check in with Abu Dhabi every two weeks and download these guys on what we're doing and what's going on. And then every year we make the trip out there and sit down and have a board meeting and walk them through not only what's happened, um, what we're doing now, but what we're working on in the future. Do you think if Anderson didn't do what he did in that fight, you would have been back sooner? I do. Did he, did he sort of kill the market? It really thing? did some serious damage there. Really? It did. Are they telling you now it's time to come back? Imagine the last few fights that we've had. Imagine if that was how we went into Abu Dhabi. So are you know? they getting antsy? Because it wasn't part of the deal to try to get the world to know about Abu Dhabi. It was kind of a, that was sort of their motive, right? That they wanted people to know Abu Dhabi is a place where you can go and visit. Yeah. So don't they want you to come back at this point? 
I mean, the world does know about Abu Dhabi. I mean, they just had Formula One there. Um, I mean, they put on concerts with, I mean, they, they, built, they built a place and Jay-Z comes and plays. And I mean, they do a lot of big things out there. Um, but you nailed it. I mean, when you just said, that fight did serious damage out there for holding another live event. Yeah, Speaking the, um, the EA Sports, the cover voting. I don't know if you saw or not, but Misha Tate That's beat Ronda Rousey <laughs> in the voting. What yeah. did you think about that, and how much has Tough had an impact on that? It seems like you know it's kind of turned the corner a little bit for Misha and Ronda. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. I mean, the difference is nobody knew who Misha Tate was. Now they do. You know, now people, and you're always going to have situations where pe people, you know, there's no way that the Ultimate Fighter was going to happen no matter how Ronda is or her personality, there's no way the ultimate fight was going to happen and 100% of the people were going to like Ronda and 0% of the people were going to like Misha. That's not how the world works, you know? Brian Caraway vote. Huh? <laughs> online, like... <laughs> you know, before... You a little bit of season three, though, when you went in with Ken and Tito and Ken was, you know, kind of the iconic UFC guy and Tito was the bad guy and then by the season's end, it kind of switched the... the, the, the I wouldn't compare anybody to Ken and Tito. <laughs> no, I wouldn't compare anybody. You know, before that started, when we were in Boston and we had the screening, Ronda was visibly upset by knowing what, what was about to come and she thought she would be perceived poorly and she didn't think she'd come off well. I'm curious if you've spoken with her since she's been doing films. You know, her crossover appeal is certainly still very high. I'm just curious if you've spoken to her about it and, and if you've noticed any fluctuation in, in my, that since the show's been airing. My honest opinion on that whole thing was that we have worked, had worked Ronda Rousey to the bone. Yeah. And I, I don't think that she was in a good place going into tough. You know, and I and you saw that there was a huge beef. Her and I are very, very tight. And there was a huge beef between her and I going into the Ultimate Fighter. You know, um, she was under a lot of pressure. She had been worked like a dog that whole year. And uh, I think that, and she'll tell you, that going away and doing these movies was the best thing that ever happened to her. She was really excited to come back and start training again and getting back into, into fighting. And I, I was just curious about the crossover appeal of some of the other champions. I guess George has been in um, Captain America. And I'm, I'm not sure, you know, I know John Jones has sort of talked about doing some things. Is that, are you, are you pro crossover? Are you pro Hollywoodization of your fighters? Or do you think it's gonna be a little bit of a distraction? No, I think, I think if you do it the way Ronda Rousey did it, I'm 100% I'm cool with it, you know? She, again, dealing with Ronda is like dealing with George St. Pierre. She's an absolute perfectionist and professional at everything she does. She literally talked to me once a week, sometimes every day when she was over uh, filming that movie. And, um, yeah, I, I got no problem with it when it's handled like that. Going back to the welterweights, with, um, you were talking about Rory and the possibility that he jumps up the ladder with the win here. What about guys like Matt Brown and Carlos Condit? Where are they in the mix in that picture? Well, they got to fight. When, when, when that next fight happens, you know, uh, when those guys fight, we'll see what happens. Do you have any sense? Go ahead, Dave. What, uh, going back to Brock a little bit, and I'm seeing the Bud Light logo in the back. <laughs> Take me back. What was your very first reaction when I flipped uh, out? I mean, me and Brock. Yeah, the, you know, me and did Brock it, went at it, it over that one. Register at the time, like. Yeah, I registered. <laughs> you guys had a real good. Uh, you guys, said, what do you call it? A whip the dog session. We had in, a, uh, in, in the uh, in the. That's the what he called room. it. Yeah. <laughs> what would you call it? <laughs> I was pissed. <laughs> Come to I was Jesus pissed. Talk. Yeah. Okay. I was pissed. Dana John Jones recently. Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on. You talked about George's hunger. Do you have any sense of? when that might end? I mean, as you say, he's got just about everything there is and uh, the target gets bigger every time. Do you have any sense that uh, we're getting to see the last of him? He's close, he's setting records with this fight. He asked earlier about breaking, you know, Anderson's records and things like that. George isn't the kind of guy that talks about that kind of stuff, but I believe, you know, if you look at the type of guy that he is and what he's accomplished, I think he's, I think that's what he's doing. Dana, John Jones said he wants to retire by 30. Anderson Silva once said he wants to retire by 35. When you hear retirement talk from guys, do you ever pay attention? It seems like it does fade, but guys like John Jones says, I want to retire by, by him 30, and I think he's, what, 25, 26? Right, you or? sit back and you think of that. It sounds like a great idea. But if you stay on the path that you're on, and with the things that we're doing, the money just keeps going like this, and that's the hard thing. Some guys have a hard time walking away from the money, and the other guys have a hard time, like Chuck Liddell, walking into a fucking stadium with, with 18,000 people screaming his name and cheering for him and, and going in and competing. You know, that that's, for a lot of the guys, it's hard to walk away from. If you add all that up together, it's almost impossible to leave. 
Sure. Dana, doing all the, yeah. the uh, 20th anniversary retrospective stuff, uh, is, is there any aspect of the history of the timeline that this brought up, reminded you of, that had sort of been forgotten, any particular story or, or aspect of it? Yeah, just the whole we did that. We shot eight weeks. Like, like Koshek said, if that edit team went back, they could go back and do another full season of The Ultimate Fighter <laughs> with a completely different story than what you saw the first time. We're in that place for eight weeks that's that's two months, man. We were it was crazy. The guys were starting to lose their mind and and, and they were starting to freak out. What again? <clears throat> when we talk back about the things that happened and didn't happen, <clears throat> close to the end of the show. Um, and I might have told this before. I don't remember, but Stefan Bonner went into the shower and turned the shower on. <clears throat> now this house was out in the middle of the fucking desert, like a house in the desert by itself. Nothing was around there. We took the alcohol out because the big fight broke out. He climbed out the window and went looking for alcohol. He's gone for three hours, okay? Like they're going to think he's taking a three-hour shower. <laughs> they end up opening the door. He's gone. They call me. I was going to kick him off the show for leaving the house. And something, I don't know what, just fucking said, fuck it. It's the end of the season. He's making it to the finale. I'm not going to kick him off the show. Is that how Southern Highlands? Yeah. You know, the, uh, Think of how not right. built up Southern Highlands was back then. Back in 05, yeah. You know, on the... That's why you recognized it as well. It's what? That act of his, how, when he climbed out the window, did that have a bit of view? <clears throat> that I would climb out the window and go look for liquor <laughs> in the middle of the desert? Um, I would like to think that I would not do that. Uh, maybe I would, but uh, no, I just, I don't know what made me not, not do it, but... Again, it's just one of those many things that if you look at and look back on that, that could have things could have gone terribly wrong. You know, the you talk about talked about on the Fighting for a Generation mm -hmm. documentary about how their father advised them against buying uh, the, the promotion. That's thing. Yeah. Was, was there anybody in your personal life that thought you were crazy or tried to get your ear at the time? You know who my mom is? <laughs> <laughs> you seen the book? No. Nobody was nobody was telling me this is a bad idea. The thing that's amazing about that, again, another thing, the Fertitas never, ever, ever, ever not did something that their father said, I don't think it's a good idea. They never did. And Frank's thing was, you know, our dad's wrong on this one. He's wrong on this one. We think that this can be something. And nobody became a bigger fan before he passed away than Mr. Fertitta. And he told the boys, you were right and I was wrong. This was, this was the right decision. You talk so about I, the soft spot that you have for guys like Josh Koscheck uh, and the Ultimate One Fighter guys. What do you feel about his position coming into this fight? That he's lost a couple of fights. Is his back up against the wall here? Josh Koscheck, uh, you know, one of the things that impresses me, of the many things that impress me about Josh Koscheck, is the well rounded fighter he's become from the wrestler that he was in season one and how much he's grown up. I mean, if you, if you listen to the guy here today, you're, you're listening to a different, he's a man. You know, he was a boy on the show, and he's become a man. Um, and I don't mean that in a condescending way. Um, I mean it as a compliment. And, uh, yeah, I just, you know, I'm, I'm the guy that was in it. I know what was at stake. I know what went down that season and all the behind the scenes and, and where we were. And I'll always have a soft spot for the guys, you know, from season one. That's so right. About a comeback season? Another comeback season? I don't know. Anything is possible. Did you ever consider going back to the, the times when they left the house? This is the first season of just, you know, a couple guys left. When we lost, we left right. the house. Yeah, things got, <laughs> the reality wasn't so good when there was two guys left in the house. <laughs> two guys sitting in the house by themselves, you know, <laughs> getting ready to fight. He said he's going to talk to you guys this uh, weekend about his contract. Is that accurate? I, I think so. I don't know. Do you, do you have plans for him? This is what we do. I mean, I just, I was with, uh, Run the shop yesterday, talking about his contract, talking to Vito. I mean, this is what we do every day. I mean, we talk about guys' contracts every day. Do you have a set uh, fight for him in his debut at 205? Um, no. How about Dan Henderson's contract? Sure we'll handle that this weekend. Just a slightly offbeat question. All your time going to Toronto, have you ever run into uh, Mayor Ford and spent time with him? <laughs> I never have. <laughs> I never have. Seems like I would have had fun if I did, though, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I had a question.
question about uh, the incognito situation. Tyron Woodley actually had said something. He knows him, says he's not a bad guy. Then he also tweeted, well, I guess they better not ever put a camera or a microphone in a, re in a you know, wrestling locker room, a fight locker room. I know you are you know, stringent about what they can say on Twitter and you like to have your policies, but do you think that's something you could ever really regulate, the razzing that these guys do behind scenes? And, and just no, in general, how you feel about that? That whole thing makes me sick. It's, it's actually embarrassing. And I think... I, you know, I, I've, I've watched a little bit of it. I haven't watched it all. But when an NFL lineman is being bullied, give me a fucking break. Come on. Uh, it's just, uh, I think, I think, I think you take the N-word out of that, there's, it's a non-starter, okay? The fact that the guy, and I don't know this guy, I don't, I don't know a lot of the story. Um, what he really should be slapped around for is the use of the N-word. That's that's what the real situation is. Yeah. Woodley trains that guy. That's what I'm saying. Trains. Tyron says he's not well, a racist. Well, I'm just curious. Is, is that you have a lot of guys uh, who uh, who he's friends with on, in the NFL, that p people that care about him, and other you know African Americans coming out and saying, "Hey, this isn't the case. He's a good guy," and and whatever. But I I just but I, I'm so I I hate that word so bad and and. and <laughs> I'm gonna sound like one of those old guys. Damn, rock and roll is ruining the country, you know. But it's like, what what makes me crazy is like, my kids right now, they listen to Jay Z and they listen to these rappers, who say this shit every other word. We're, we're in a we're in a we're in a situation right now with this with this new generation that's coming up, right? That word could go away. That word could go away. When I grew up. You know what I mean? It's, it was a different world. Exactly. It was a different world when we grew up. There's, there's a chance now for that world to go away. And, and, and I know I sound like some old guy. Like, like I said, rock and roll is destroying the world and shit. But that word, that word needs to go away and rappers need to start saying it, stop saying it. It's not, there's this whole, you know, we can say it but you can't thing. No, you can't. Because if you say it, my kids are hearing that shit. My kids have never heard that word. Never heard that word in my house growing up. But now they're listening to this shit and they hear it. And it's just, it's, we took a real left turn here. But, you know, I'm just saying, it's just, that's one of the things that drives me crazy. And I think that the whole incognito situation is more about the N-word than it is anything then else. So yeah. What? Time is it? Okay. So why, hey, you know, it's me. You know, with question, I'm going to ask. Hawaii. Are we going Hawaii. to Hawaii? Oh, yes, yeah, so are we coming to Hawaii? We're going to, you guys are going to different territories, new countries every year. Um, there's no place I would love to go more than Hawaii. <laughs> Come on, we got, right. we got we got all these fighters. We've yeah. got you've got BJ Bet. You got ruthless Robbie Lawler who really, he re he rebuilt his career in Hawaii. Um, got Yancey. You got uh, we got all the, we got you know just tons of fighters. Sorry, my friend. <laughs> I, have no, I have no good news for you. Serious? Yeah. How about Dan Henderson's contract? You said you were going to give him a couple weeks after that fight to talk. Uh, so and right when we were flying back, one of our lawyers. Emailed his lawyer, and I know we're starting to talk, so we'll see what happens. How about his health? Have you heard anything different after Dan? No, he's yeah. good. He's yeah. Good? Yep, he's good. And is Vitor getting a title shot? <laughs> Vitor is getting a title shot. I, I'm, uh, I'm blown away by Vitor. You know, Vitor has been a pain in my ass, you know, for a long time, and dealing with Vitor is 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 always interesting. But how do you not respect what this guy has done? Listen. The kid gets smashed for TRT. Tons of people are on TRT. It's, it's legal. People are doing it. TRT doesn't make you fucking kick better. TRT doesn't make you do spinning back kicks. TRT doesn't. The kid is becoming, I keep calling him a kid. He's, the guy is becoming a well-rounded fighter. It's like he's, uh, I, I think the best thing is that Vitor has been this flaky guy who has been loaded with talent, explosiveness, and, and knockout power. Now he's finally with a camp. Like, Vitor would travel around, and he'd set up a camp here, and he'd set up a camp there, and, and, and he'd kind of do his own thing, and was coasting on this talent that he possessed. Now he's with this team, and he looks better than he's ever looked. He lifted Dan Henderson off his feet when he hit him with that uppercut. And then to hit him with that uppercut and then come back with the kick as soon as he gets up on his feet, next level shit, man. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's good stuff, and... Uh, uh, it's fun. I, I'm looking forward to what's next for Vitor Belfort. You can see that from BJ. Huh? Be nice to see that from BJ. Yeah. Yeah. Why? <laughs> Why? But, but isn't, isn't 
Since we're being judged on the, the, the TRT and the positive steroid test from the past as well, and that's when There's the two things come That's happened to other people too. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's, you know, unfortunately, it's part of this sport. Vitor Pelfort paid his dues. He, he, when he was punished when this happened. He was punished for it. And, you know. Have you said it's a no-brainer that he fights the winner of Weidman and Silver now? Then? Is it nailed? Now? I just, Is the no-brainer. Big fights. Listen, Dan Henderson, Dan Henderson has lost his last three fights, okay? Him and Rashad went the distance to fight before. Who did he fight before that? Machida. Machida, okay? Vitor lifted him off his feet and knocked him out. I don't know if you saw my video blog. When his foot was against the cage, his leg was shaking. Dan Henderson's leg was shaking, you know? I was in the back going, holy... I just said, I said, holy shit for like 10 minutes. <laughs> Dan Henderson might have lost three in a row, but what Vitor Belfort did to Dan Henderson, I'm, I'm excited. Ever. Mm-hmm. And he's fought everybody on the planet twice. Mm-hmm. You know? It's unbelievable. Um, if it is the final question, I guess. Um, um, do, do we have to have some sympathy with him? Not wanting to fight a young guy who could could theoretically end his career, and I'm talking about Rory McDonald here, who he seems to have given everything to to bring him through. Is is that? Do you understand? You look at the culture of boxing. Yeah. Okay. The guy who beat Muhammad Ali used to be Muhammad Ali's sparring partner. That's how that's the, that's how this shit works, man. And you 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 pay your dues. You work your way up. George St. Pierre has had his day. He's had his time. He's had his day. He does. He, and, and having that championship and having that belt, it is your obligation to give every guy an opportunity to win it. Donald Cerrone uh, did not have to go to performance in his last fight. Now he's saying he's going to drop down to 145 even before this fight. He's fighting on Saturday. What is your uh, take on that? Is that is it surprising to hear of a guy talking about a move before an actual fight, considering how his last Nothing fight went? Nothing surprises me. It's up to him. You know, whatever he wants to do. I like Cerrone. Cerrone's one of those guys that comes out and goes balls to the wall. You know, he's a killer, be killed type fighter. You like that idea of him at 145? <coughs> Can you explain uh, why Manuel got the Gustafson fight? You explain why he shouldn't have. Well, he's, I mean, in most rankings, I know the UFC rankings, which are very good. Uh, I don't believe he's top 10. So how does the guy who is, you know, arguably 2, 1, uh, based on how those rankings go, how does he fight a guy, Man, and then if he beats him, gets a title shot? Is, 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 there's no, there's no, did we say he gets a title shot if he, he wins that? No, Gustafson gets a title shot. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Him. You think Gustafson does, doesn't deserve a title shot? Well, as we said in Houston, I think he deserves it right now. Yeah. But why does a win over Manoa, if you're going to put him well, back into the pool? not only can we not do it right now, he's got to fight. Right. He has to fight. He wants to fight. Manoa is undefeated, and this kid's getting an opportunity to, to fight Gustafson. Um, I told you yesterday that, that Jones will fight February 22nd. He won't fight February 22nd. He just pulled out of that fight. What happened? I don't know. He's yeah. not fighting February 22nd. And, uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, so it's one of those situations he's got to fight. So is he injured? No, he's not injured. Hmm? Not on the 22nd, no. It might, it might be March now. It might be March now. Is the card still continuing in Vegas on the 22nd? Yeah. Okay. You don't December. have, obviously, a replacement. No, not yet. I mean, I just found out before I came here. Uh, quick thought on Nick Diaz. I know you said you had a conversation with him. You, can you no, I had gauge? a conversation with his lawyer. Do you, do you think he'll fight again? How do you, how do you think this is going to play out? Well, who knows? I mean, I don't even know what to say about it anymore. Yeah. Um, so when he's ready to fight, he can call me. I think he's wrapped up in his own head a little bit. I don't know what he's doing. I think he's got a lot of money, and he's kicking back and enjoying himself. That's what I think. Knock on wood, how excited are you about the Super Bowl card? With I'm really. Cruz coming back. Yeah, I'm so excited for that cruz Barrow fight. I'm really excited. You know, I was when you start going through the stats on that fight, Tanner Barrow has a 95% takedown defense. Um, cruz has a, like, 84% or 85% takedown defense rate. Um Cruz hasn't lost a fight in six years. Hannon Burrell hasn't lost a fight in eight years. He's on a 30-fight win streak. 
Uh, Cruz is on a 10 fight win streak. That's a fight, man. I'm excited. Barral goes in and, and literally destroys people. Uh, Cruz has this style where he can pick you apart and, and, and make you look bad and win fights. And I love it. I love that fight. I love that fight. I'm excited that that fight's finally happened. That's one of those, this is one of those, those fights that, that, that this ante- anticipation has been built, people waiting for it, and, and I'm excited. And we think Cruz is 100, 110%? Cruz is 200%. 200%. He's so ready. He's ready. I, yeah. yeah. Mentally, I'm saying he wants I it so I, bad. I shouldn't say this, but I will, because this is what I fucking do to myself. <laughs> um, I think the Cruz has kind of been stalling. I think the Cruz has dragged this thing out longer than needed to be because I think that he's been working extra hard on working off the ring rust, doing the things that, you know, this just came to our attention a few weeks ago, that Cruz possibly could have fought much sooner. So, which makes the fight even more interesting. Does that make you mad? Does that that upset you? I, I don't fucking blame him. You want to take two years off and come in and fight Hennon Barra? That's what we've asked you about for a long I would, time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what do you get a tune-up fight, like that kind of stuff? Yeah, if I took two weeks off, I'd, I'd be worried about fighting Hennon Barra. <laughs> Dad, did you hear about Whitey? Mm-hmm. What do you think? I mean, the guy's, the guy's uh, which ought to be what, two months? <laughs> I mean, how old is he now? 106. Yeah, he looks it, but he's 84 years old, you know? The guy's been able to live on the outside and live his life and spend his money and do his thing, and... Uh, one of the most unique characters in the history of America. Hey, after uh, the Indian fight, uh, you said you were disappointed about uh, Eric Perez's attitude towards uh, PR and, and press. Do you had a chance to speak to him? Is he doing better than that? I don't know. You guys can tell me that one. Is he doing better? Is he? Where's my? Hey, how's Eric Perez doing with PR now? Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> there you go. Awesome. I like it. About the analyst thing earlier, this is going to kind of, kind of sound like a strange question, but Gina Carano just recently filmed a show for Fox, uh, Almost Human. Have you ever thought about bringing in a female analyst for some of the women's yeah. fights, like maybe oh, a Gina Carano or definitely, you know, Gina Carano could definitely be one of those people. Um, I, I think that you know, so, so, uh, just like the guys, so many of these girls are very intelligent. They understand the fight game. That they could break it down just like the men could. You'll see it happen. The thing is, the women's division is so new. These women are still, you know, finding their place in in in, uh, in the sport. So, there there will absolutely positively be women. Would you be interested in somebody like a Gina though, because she's you know obviously done with her fighting career, but you know very prolific, very she's very done popular with her fighting career. But she's doing all right. She, I mean, she's, she's she's doing all right. Yeah. Right. We got Karen Bryant. I mean, come on. Hey. Hey. I gotta go. I gotta go to a fight. I'll take I'll take a couple more questions. That he wants to, to fight in Maracana, the biggest Brazilian soccer stadium. Is that possible to happen? Very possible. The possibilities for Vitor Belfort right now are limitless. I mean, Vitor Belfort, we could do a fight in a soccer stadium there. We could come back here to the MGM in Vegas. We could go to the fucking North Pole and put on a fight with Vitor Belfort. The thing is with Vitor, I was just talking to uh, Kevin last night. The numbers that we do in Brazil when Vitor Belfort fights are ridiculous. I mean, the website goes up 65% when he's on the main event. Ticket sales go up 50-something percent when he's on the main event. Um, uh, The list goes on and on of of ridiculous stats when Vitor Belfort is on a card in Brazil. So, you know, the whole, uh, again, gets the bad rap for the whole TRT thing and, and, you know, fights in Brazil because he's a motherfucking rock star in Brazil. Speaking of big draws, do you have an update on Kane uh, versus Fabricio? No. Kane just did that uh, tour for us in Mexico. You know, his shoulder is injured. He's going through rehab, and now it's just a waiting game to see how he recovers. Because what I heard the other day is I guess they said he probably doesn't have to have surgery. Right, he doesn't. Yeah, good. Yeah. Can you put the uh, Victor fight at the same card uh, at Vanderlei and Sonic? It's an idea. It, obviously, that would be awesome, you know? I don't know. The night that I said it in Brazil, I'm just saying these are possibilities. Anything is possible, you know? And, and when I was giving you those numbers in Brazil, you're talking about a guy who isn't even a champion. You're talking about a guy who's just headlines a main event. He's not the champ. But it goes to show you what people think of Vitor Belfort in, 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 in Brazil. I got to go to a fight. 
Cool. Thanks, guys. Nice. All right. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.